Well, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good morning, my beloved. This is Minister S. N. Crockett Jr. with our weekly program, The Truth of the Gospel. The Truth of the Gospel. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're coming to you this morning. Today is the 13th of November of 2022. So we're almost at the end of this year, of this calendar year. We're almost at the end of the calendar year. We thank the Lord for bringing us as far as he has. We thank him through his mercy, his love, his grace, his power, and his glory. We come to you, and we're going to continue today in 1 John, but we're going to couple it, as I said when I first started teaching from 1 John, there would be times we would go to the gospel according to John, the gospel according to John. And so what we want to do today is we want to spend time in John chapter 12, in 1 John 2, 15 through 29. Now, whether we'll get to all of those verses today uh, remains to be seen remains to be seen. So what we're going to do today, we're going to speak to you for a little while from the thought, I smell a conspiracy. I smell, and I'm dealing with my technology here, so please forgive me. I smell a conspiracy. I smell a conspiracy. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We talked a few weeks ago from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 12, when Lisa, after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. So we're going we're gonna to deal with that passage of Scripture again. We're going to tie it into 1 John 2 and 14. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we bless you. We thank you for the privilege of mentioning your name. In the name of your dear Holy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and eternal kingdom both now and forever. Amen and amen. We ask that you bless this teaching. We ask that you bless teaching and preaching all over the world, that there be a great manifestation of fruit and gifts and gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit, according to your good, acceptable, and perfect will. Blessed be your name forever. For all things are in your hands. All time is in your hands. Eternity is in your hands. O oh, gracious Lord God, blessed be your name. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray that you strengthen them and bless them and encourage them, Lord, by Jesus Christ, by your Holy Spirit. Leading God, us, Lord, to continue to pray for them, that you may strengthen them when we encourage them when they're discouraged. Build them up when they're torn down, Lord, strengthen them when they're weak. By Jesus, your Holy Son, we pray we, for, we repent for our sins this day, Lord. We repent for any sins we've committed since the last time we approached your most holy, most holy throne. By Jesus Christ, we pray, help us to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Help us, Lord God, to say no to sin, yes to righteousness, which is only in your Holy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory, power, majesty, and dominion, both now and forever. Amen. And amen. So we're in 1 John. We're in the Gospel according to John. John chapter 12. Let's begin with John 12. Now, if you remember from John 11, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And so, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let me pick up at verse. Uh, uh, let's see. Jesus says in John 11 and 36, 37. And some of them said, could not this man, talking about Jesus, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man, talking about Lazarus, should not have died? Notice they, they didn't understand the context of what Jesus was doing. Jesus let Lazarus die. Because if he had not let Lazarus die, he wouldn't have been able to obviously raise him from the dead and proclaim himself as the resurrection and the life. Remember, um, Lazarus' sisters came to Jesus, he whom you love, and they said to him, he whom you love is sick. So at that point, Lazarus was sick. He had not yet died. And Jesus did not rush to uh, heal Lazarus, but he, he, the Bible says at the beginning of John 11, he waited two more days. He let Lazarus die. And some people would say, oh, how cruel. Is this man who, you know, Crockett, you say uh, that we should serve him and obey him and adore him and worship him, etc. But he let Lazarus die so that the, so that God could be glorified. Remember, God's glory is more important than uh, fulfilling our temporal, our, our personal ambitions and will. It's the will of God. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. He said himself, I didn't even come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my Father in heaven. So he let Lazarus die. That should be a message to us. He let Lazarus die so that, remember John said, uh, we beheld Jesus' glory. When Jesus walked the earth and the things that he did, the miracles, etc. John said, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so letting Lazarus die and raising him from the dead 
we beheld Jesus' glory, but of course also we, we beheld the glory of the Father. Right? And doesn't the song, I believe it's in the Methodist church, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, it shall be now and forever. I'm terribly paraphrasing it, world without end, amen, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, etc. Of course, the Holy the, Bible, the Scriptures say the Holy Spirit uh, will not speak on his own authority, but will point to Jesus, right? Okay, so uh, so some of them said, could not this man who, which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, because remember, Jesus wept. He cometh to the grave. There was a cave and a stone lay upon it. That was a common form of burial during that day. Not like we do today with six feet under, etc. More, more like what they do like in Louisiana because of the water table in Louisiana. They, they bury people above ground, etc. Similar to that. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. See that? If you would believe, I'm going to show you the glory of God. And not in the resurrection at the last day, because remember Martha made that point of Mary. One of them made that point previous in John 11. Oh, I know you're going to raise him from the dead. At the last day, she was talking about the general resurrection that Jews knew about. Of course, there was no knowledge of the rapture. That was a mystery um, revealed to the church. But uh, Jesus said, now, did, did, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? You see that? The, he, Jesus, let that Jesus let Lazarus die so that the glory of God could be revealed. He let Lazarus die knowing that Mary and Martha would cry and others would cry. And there, there were professional weepers in those days, people who were professional wailers, professional criers, etc. Jesus let all that happen. He let all that play out for the glory of God. And that should be a lesson to us. Are we living for the glory of God? Or are we living for our own temporal satisfaction? And uh, let's see. The, in verse 41, John 11. And then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. See, Jesus does things. He did things for the glory of God and to affirm that he uh, is the Messiah, the sent one, Yeshua HaMashiach, Joshua, the Messiah, the, the, the one promised by Moses and the prophets to be sent for the salvation both of Gentiles and Jews. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. He, he's, 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 he's laid, he set the stage. He let Lazarus die. He came, oh Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. We would have all been happy. And Jesus was like, no, that, no, no I'm, I'm here to represent the Father. I'm, I'm here for the glory of God. Right? And he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, I'm not praying because I'm doubting or anything. I'm praying to, to strengthen the faith of those around me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Hallelujah. Doesn't the Bible say in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout? Glory to God. This right here, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, this is like a type, a foreshadowing of the resurrection of believers. For the Lord himself, 1 Thessalonians 4, for the Lord himself, not See, there, there are some things the Lord, I've said this many times, there are, some thing, there are some things the Lord sends others to do. He sends prophets and apostles and pastors, evangelists, teachers, etc. But there are some things that the Lord has to do himself. Like when he died, the Bible says, one of my favorite passages of, of scripture, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, 1, 3, when he had by himself, glory to the Lamb of God, when he had by himself purged our sins. You hear that? He didn't, he, he didn't say when he and Crockett or when he and the Pope, he and Mary, he and Paul, he and Peter, he and James, John, Matthew, Bartholomew. He and, he and, he and, he and the Pharisees, no. He and the Romans, no. When he had by himself, glory to the Lamb of God. When he had by himself purged our sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There's some things the Lord has to do himself because only because he's the only one qualified to do it. Go to Revelation 5 when you get a chance. And, and John wept much because nobody was found worthy to open the seven sealed scroll, scroll which was a title deed to the, the earth, to the kingdom, etc. And John wept much because nobody was found worthy in heaven or earth. Heaven sent out an executive search party. And nobody in heaven or earth, or the Bible says in Revelation 5, or under the earth, glory be to the Lamb of God. Nobody in heaven or earth or under the earth was found worthy to open the seven seals scroll. And John, John wept much because he knew what it meant. He knew that total redemption, final redemption, could not take place unless that, that seven sealed scroll, which was common in those days when someone made a will, they sealed it with seven seals in, in, in the presence of witnesses. And John knew that unless that seven sealed scroll were unsealed, that final redemption could not take place. And then one of the elders, one of the 24 elders said, uh, John, uh, weep not. You know, there's a song that says, oh, Mary, don't you weep. But this one said, oh, John, don't you weep. Weep not. The lion of the tribe of Judah, hallelujah, has, has prevailed to open the seven sealed scroll. And John looked. And when he looked, he didn't see a lion. He saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Of course, that was Jesus. So my point is, and I'll get back, that some things Jesus has to do himself. He had to die. He himself, the Bible says, purged our sins. He had to die on the cross for our sins. The ironic priesthood could not purge our sins. Those sacrifices, lambs, bullocks, and goats, as so eloquently um, explained in the epistle to the Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians, could not, could not, could not, could not purge our sins. Jesus, hallelujah. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he was the only one who could purge our sins. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. And so it was Jesus. He's, he's, he's the only one, right? And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. Somebody said if he had just said, come forth, that everybody, all who had died would come out of the grave. All the old prophets and patriarchs and matriarchs. You know, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it makes for good preaching. <laughs> Glory to God. But he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, listen, believed on him. See, what he did was for the glory of the, of the Father. But in glorifying the Father, the Father glorified the Son. And many of the Jews which had uh, come to weep with Mary and, and Martha, and, uh, and, and when they had seen the things that Jesus did, they believed on him. Ah, but you had your... You're always going to have your snitches. <laughs> they say snitches get stitches. <laughs> You're going to always have your snitches. You're going to always have your snitches. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Little tattletale, little, well, I'm not going to use the language I want to use. Little snitches and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. See, we got a scam going here. And if, if we let him alone, the people who are the victims of our scam, they, they, we're, gonna, we're not going to have our scam anymore. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. Because the Romans pretty much left you alone. They let you worship your gods and, you know, they let you do what you wanted to do. As long as you didn't offend the Romans, as long as you didn't blaspheme the Caesars and, you know, long as they, they left you alone. You were under their rule. Palestine was under their rule. They didn't mess with you. It was called the Pax Romana, the, you know, the Roman peace. You know, they could be brutal, but on the other side of the coin, they, they pretty much left you alone as long as you didn't, you know, mess up their, their scam that <laughs> they, they had going. If we, let, if we let Jesus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said unto them, You know nothing at all. You knuckleheads, you know nothing at all, right? 
nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied. You know, God can use believers and unbelievers. He can use unbelievers to, to prophesy, to speak his will. Here's Caiaphas. He was a part of the Jewish nation, but he was, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was part of the people who were in opposition to Jesus. He prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad, the diaspora, the scattering abroad of the, of the Jews. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put Jesus to death. Jesus therefore walked no more among the, openly among the Jews, but went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim. Uh, and there continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they, then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye that he would come that he would not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might uh, take him. So that's our background that leads us into John 12, which is where we're going to see that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And after he'd been, and, and I believe that Lazarus, that, that Lazarus being raised from the dead, I believe it's a typology, a foreshadowing of all believers being raised from the dead, both the church and uh, uh, those outside the church in the nation of Israel, etc. The kingdom, the, the whole resurrection, if you will, right? You've you got the rapture, if, if you believe in the rapture, which I do. You got the rapture of the church, but you also have the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, etc. And then you have the resurrection of the tribulation saints. I believe there will be a tribulation after the rapture. So you're going to have the, the resurrection of the tribulation saints. So I believe that the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead is a foreshadowing of the resurrection of all believers. Because if you notice in chapter 12, what's going to happen? And, and if it's only a, a foreshadowing of one part of the resurrection, I would have to choose that it's a foreshadowing of the resurrection of the church. Because the Bible says again in 1 Thessalonians 4 that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. I preached years ago that he's going to send a shout out. The Lord's going to send a shout out. I preached that years ago. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ. You hear that? The dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which, are, we which are, are alive and remain, Paul said, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's, that's a prophecy of the resurrection of the church. And so if you look when, right before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he spoke with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So that is, I believe, and I'm not being dogmatic about it, but I believe that's a foreshadowing of the resurrection probably of the church, but if not just of the church, the resurrection of believers. Now we get to chapter 12, where, Ra where Lazarus, <coughs> excuse me, had been raised from the dead, and in joy and jubilation, there was a feast. Then Jesus, this is John 12, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Now, who, who is him? Is it, it, did they make the supper for Jesus or did they make the supper for Lazarus? I think they made it for Lazarus. They were in such jubilation that their brother had been raised from the dead. I, I think that, that, that the him here is a reference. It's like a direct object uh, pronoun, right? Him. There they made, I'm sorry, indirect object pronoun, right? There they made him a supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, if I can get back into typology a little bit more, I believe this is a typology of the fellowship we will have with Jesus in the kingdom. This is like a foreshadowing of the fellowship we're going to have with Jesus in the kingdom after we've been raised from the dead or raptured, whatever the case may be, tribulation, saint, or whatever. I believe this is a foreshadowing of that. Because notice Lazarus, who had been in the grave for four days, and his sister said, Lord, don't, don't open the tomb because... He's been dead four days, and by now he, he stinketh, right? 
and Jesus raised him from the dead, there's no more stench of death, right? So I believe that this is a force, just as his resurrection was a foreshadowing, in my opinion, of the resurrection of the just and possibly the resurrection of the church. Now, now Lazarus is, ch is chilling with Jesus. And they, they, there's, a, there's a supper. Um, and again, I don't know who the, if this hymn is referring to Lazarus or Jesus. I believe it's a, it's a reference to Lazarus. But somebody else said, might, might say, no, it's a reference to, that they made a feast for Jesus. I'm not going to be dogmatic. I believe it's Lazarus, but fine. There's a feast going on. There they made him. Let me read it again. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been raised from the, which had been dead, whom Jesus raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. I believe the hymn is a reference to Lazarus and Jesus being the very social individual that he was. He would often often go to these events, like like the wedding in Cana of Galilee, etc. And, and there were some events he would be invited to, etc. He would go there as a as an either a, un, an invited guest or an uninvited guest. He, Jesus was social. He was social without being sinful. Glory, that a preach. Jesus was social without being sinful. That's not always easy, because sometimes in, in our effort to be social and not be stuck up and be, you know, holier than thou Christians, if we're not careful, we become not just social but we become sinful. Jesus was social. I might have to preach that one day. I feel a stirring in my spirit. Jesus was social without being sinful. So there they made him a supper, and Martha, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Okay, so the hymn could be a reference to Jesus. It looks like the hymn is a reference to Jesus, but again, I'm not sure. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Here, here, and here, here's where the Holy Spirit reveals people's motives. This Judas said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He had the bag. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Spirit knows Jesus, God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He knows our motives. Judas is doing all this big preaching. Why was this costly ointment, you know, why was it wasted on Jesus' feet? It could have been sold for 300 pence and the proceeds given to the poor. And, you know, people sitting around might have said, oh, what a wonderful, um, you know, sentiment. You know, Judas, what a wonderful sentiment. You know, how religious this man is. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is saying, no, 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 no. I, I, when I was growing up, we had a saying, I peep your whole card. <laughs> Meaning, I know, I know what you're up to. I peep your whole card. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And as a discerner, a perfect discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of men. See, you can tell, you, you can say that in front of me and I might go, oh, how religious, how, how thoughtful. Then you know, this guy's probably right. You know, we, we should have sold that and given the proceeds, at least some of the proceeds to the poor. You know, Judas is right. But the Holy Spirit revealed to John who wrote this gospel, the Holy Spirit revealed to him, mm-mm. Judas, Judas running the scale. He's trying to run the scale. Judas was going to steal that ointment. And, and he was going to sell it for 300 pence and keep the proceeds. Because notice what the Holy Spirit revealed here. This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Jesus knew he was a thief, but the other apostles probably did not know. But Jesus knew. Jesus had the capacity to be in this man's presence for about three years, knowing that he was a devil. Jesus said, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? And some expositors interpret that not one of you is influenced by the devil, but one of you is the devil. Because remember at this very, at the, at the supper uh, in the upper room, the Bible says when Judas took the, took the, uh, the, the uh, food of, the, of what we call the last supper, Satan, the Bible says Satan entered into him and he left. 
and went out to betray Jesus. And then John, using the motif of light and darkness, John said, and it was night. That motif of light and darkness, righteousness and sin, right? John said, and it was night, right? So, so the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, the Holy Trinity, if you will, knew that, G that the Judas was trying to run the okie doke, right? Why was not this ointment sold for 300? So, you know, we, we, we just got to, the Bible tells us to be as discerning as possible. We're not going to always discern everything because God is not going to always give us um, um, knowledge about everything. If he did, we, we would never pray. But God knows all things, right? This he said, not be the, because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Judas was a thief. He was, he was what we would call today, he was embezzling. He was embezzling from the company. <laughs> he was he was he was embezzling from Jesus and Jesus and Apostles uh, LLC, <laughs> Limited Liability Corporation. Right? He was embezzling. This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had a bag. He had the bag, and he bare what was put therein. Then Jesus said, "Leave her alone." In essence, Jesus said, "Shut up, Judas. Leave her alone." Against the day of my burying has she kept this. In other words, she's anointed my body for my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but me you do not always have. Now here we're going to get to the crux of where I want to get to. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only. This is where we talked a few weeks ago about how if you want to be an influencer, I talked about how many people, how many followers are on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. People like Taylor Swift have and Barack Obama and, and you know, famous celebrities, Migos, etc. You know, uh, uh, comfort to their family for their loss. Uh, but if you want to be an influencer, notice Lazarus, who'd been raised from the dead, it said the, the people came to the feast not just to see Jesus, but that they might also see Lazarus whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So if you want to be an influencer, you don't have to have a million followers on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or the other social media uh, platforms. If you want to be an influencer, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And by following Jesus, you'll be an influence, influencer. You won't be an influencer in the way that Taylor Swift is or the way that uh, you know other entertainers are or politicians or you know uh, Joe Biden or his wife or you know, Congressperson AOC, et cetera, Nancy Pelosi, or the uh, or your athletes, you know, who may have two hundred thousand followers on Facebook and uh, eight hundred thousand followers on uh, Instagram and Twitter and other social media outlets, et cetera. You won't be an influencer in that way, but you'll be an influencer for eternity if you believe in Jesus, if you follow our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but also that they might see Lazarus. You see that? They said they didn't come just to see Jesus, as important as that is. They didn't just come to see Jesus, as important as that is, because he's the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. He's the object of our worship, the bright and the morning star, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, etc. They also came to see Lazarus. Showing the influence that the life of Jesus, when it's infused into our lives, showing the influence that we can have. That's the only point I'm trying to get to here. Before I get to the, the I smell a conspiracy part, I'm, I'm getting there. That when we are spiritually raised from the dead, we, we know Jesus is going to literally raise us from the dead one day if, if we're not alive when the rapture comes. If you believe in the rapture, which I do. But before we are literally raised from the dead, when we give our lives to Jesus, we are spiritually raised from the dead. Paul said it to the Ephesians. He said, you have he quickened. You were, you were dead in trespasses and sins. The Holy Spirit quickens you when you give your life to Christ, when you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God has literally bodily raised him from the dead. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will quicken you and that once dead spirit within you now becomes alive in Christ. And now people... People want to not only see Jesus, but they want to see Jesus in you and in me. Paul said, we are living epistles, letters, right? We are living epistles. Here's the scary part, known and read of all men. People are reading our lives. People who will, people who will never read the book of John. There's some people, they ain't going to never read 21 chapters of John. You know, they're just not going to do it. 
There's some people who would never read what Isaiah. What? 66 chapters of Isaiah? Most preachers ain't going to read 66 chapters of Isaiah. What? What, 51? I think it is 52 chapters of Jeremiah? Are you kidding? 48 chapters of Ezekiel? 28 chapters of Matthew? 16 chapters of Mark? 24 chapters of Luke? Right? 21 chapters of John? 28 chapters of Acts? 16 chapters of Romans? Most people are not going to read it. You can, you can have, you know, Bible reading through the year and, you know, and all that is great. Most people are not going to do all that. So God says, okay, you're not going to, you're going to, you're not going to read, uh, uh, 50 chapters of Genesis. All right. I got somebody out there who's a living epistle, a living, a living book of Exodus or, you know, Leviticus or a living book of Revelation or Jude or first John. Okay. I got some people, God says, I don't have many, but I got some people out there who are living epistles known and read of all men. So people are reading our lives. They're reading our lives every day. It's scary because, you know, we, we mess up sometimes. <laughs> I know I do. But people are reading our lives every day. And so, so, and so the Bible says we're living epistles. And so people came not only for Jesus' sake, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. Did, has Jesus raised you from the dead? Have you trusted in Christ for your eternal salvation? then people want to see you because they want to see what Christ has done, right, in your life and in my life. They may not say anything. They may not say, I'm here to see your life. They, they probably won't say anything. But they're watching your life. They're watching my life. If you don't believe me, mess up. <laughs> what, what, ain't he a preacher? Didn't, don't he have a, a gospel program called The Truth of the Gospel? Every Sunday, isn't he a reverend? I, did, I thought I saw a collar around his neck. If you, if you don't believe people watching your life, mess up. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> mess up. Right. So people are reading our lives every day. Right? Uh, much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that Jesus was there. They came not only for Jesus' sake, but that they also might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted. And here's, the, here's the I smell a conspiracy part. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death. The religious people who were opposed to the resurrection power of Jesus. Let me say that again. The religious people, not the pimps, the players, the prostitutes, the women sliding on a pole, the mafia types, the gangbangers, the extortioners, and on and on and on and on. No, the religious people who were opposed to the resurrection power of Jesus being in Lazarus' life. Let me say that again, because it has application for us. The religious people, not the pimp, not the prostitute. Remember, in one case in Luke, there was a prostitute who, who, who poured ointment on Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair and, and dry, you know, and, and with her. And, uh, no, it wasn't. No, it, no, no, those are not the ones you have to worry about here. Not the pimp, not the prostitute, the player, not the mafia type. You got to worry about these people for other things in some cases, but not the mafia type, not the extortioner, not the tax cheat, not the gang banger, not the crypt, the blood, the black stone ranger, you know, the, 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 the 49er, you know, and other, you know, gangs, et cetera, the, the gangster disciple and all that kind of stuff. Mm -mm. The, the, you know, la, uh, the trece, so the trece, you know, the Mexican mafia, la M, right? Salvatruce and all the gangs out of Latin America. No. Here, the religious people who, who were intimidated and offended because the resurrection power of Jesus. You hear that? Before this, before that, they, they weren't giving a stud about Lazarus. They weren't studying La well, Lazarus. That's not Mary and Martha, brother. What about him? So what? But now that the resurrection power of Jesus, hallelujah. Remember, Jesus said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So now that the resurrection power of Jesus, just like when you were born again, Jesus spoke to your heart and revealed himself by the Holy Spirit. Then you made a decision. It was the will of God now met with your will and your will said, I believe that Jesus is Lord. And when you said, I believe that Jesus is Lord, and I believe that, 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 that the Father has raised him from the dead, when you made that decision, the resurrection, of power, the resurrection power of Jesus truly began to operate in your life, as in my life in May, May of 1979. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, him, I know him here is Lazarus, 
by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So part of the, part of the conspiracy is religious people who don't really believe in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Paul talked about him in, um, oh, I believe it was the uh, one of the epistles to Timothy. I believe it was one of the epistles to, I know it was one of the epistles to Timothy. I don't know the exact passage, the exact chapter and verse. But Paul talked about those who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They have a form of godliness. They have outward righteousness. Uh, they, 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 they are self-righteous. Paul said to Timothy, Watch out for people who have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. You hear that? Now, now take that scripture that Paul said years later after the resurrection of Christ, because this is before the crucifixion and resurrection here in John. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They wanted to kill Jesus. And they said, now, we, we, not only are we going to kill Jesus, we're going to kill these fools who are following him. And I use the word fools in quotes. This, this is what they were thinking. Because that by reason of him, notice Lazarus became an influencer. Because that by reason of him, by Lazarus, because he had been raised from the dead, right? By reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Many of the Jews who had been enslaved to the religious, the stifling legalism of the Pharisees and the scribes, they now had freedom in Christ. Christ came and set them free. He had said in John 8 that if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you shall know the truth and you shall, and the truth shall make you free. And now and see people are following Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Do you see that? Let's see. Am I in the same chapter? Yes. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, now what we call Palm Sunday, here now Jesus riding into Jerusalem. In fulfillment of prophecy in Zechariah, behold, your king cometh, riding on a colt, in the foal of an ass, etc. Your king, your, your king, but he's coming lowly. He's, he's not riding on a chariot like Caesar, etc. Your king is coming. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. And they cried, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel. Whoa, 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 whoa what, huh, what? The Pharisees and the religious hypocrites who wanted Jesus dead and wanted Lazarus dead. What? What? What did you say? Blessed is the king of Israel. What? The son of David? Huh? That cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. See, as, as it is written. Back in Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave ah, and raised him from the dead, they bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for they heard that he had done this miracle. You see that? The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. All right, so I'll stop there as far as my St. John reference. But let me read one more time before I go to 1 John. Remember, I smell a conspiracy. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. There's a feast given for, for, for I believe it was for Jesus, but Lazarus was there. He had been raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So I believe the feast was for Jesus and Lazarus was there, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, very expensive, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, whose disciples? Jesus' disciples. But he, but no, I don't, I don't want to get off into that. I, uh, that gets off another subject. Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And again, the people around might have said, oh, what a noble gesture on the part of Judas, one of Jesus' disciples. But the Holy Spirit peeped his whole card. The Holy Spirit let John the Apostle know who, who would go on to write this gospel. 
This he said, this Judas said, not because he cared for the poor. Judas didn't care about the poor. Judas was a narcissist. A narcissist, extreme narcissist especially, only cares about him or herself. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag. He was the treasurer. It's bad when the treasurer is a thief. He was an embezzler. He was stealing from the corporation of Jesus and his apostles, LLC. Right? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but, but, but because he was a thief and he had the bag, and he bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, to uh, let her alone, leave her alone. He rebuked Judas. Against this day of my burying, she hath kept this. She has anointed my body for burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom Jesus had raised from the dead. In other words, Lazarus became an influencer. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Here's the conspiracy, then I'll move on to 1 John. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They conspired. There's your conspiracy. They conspired, you know, to, to assault the Capitol on January 6th, right? They conspired to put Lazarus to death because that by reason of him, because Lazarus became an influencer. Because by reason of him, and hopefully by reason of you and by reason of me, hopefully we're influencers. Paul said living, we're living epistles, known and read of all men. People are reading our lives. That, that's, that's, that should scare us. And it should also cause us to want to walk uprightly before the Lord and before people, both saved and unsaved. But that they might see Lazarus also whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted to put Lazarus to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. I smell a conspiracy. And it wasn't, it wasn't the pimp, the prostitute, the mafia type. The gangbanger. The woman sliding down the pole. Except the tax cheat, the extortioner. The publican, it, the person would have been called. In the days of the Romans... It was the religious people, and, and religious people who, who love Jesus are great. But when you have religious people who don't really believe in the resurrection power of Jesus, and many are in churches, you got the visible church made up of believers, but it's also made up of unbelievers. The invisible church, the ecclesia, those who have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, that's the invisible church. That's made up of true believers, but you have a visible church on earth whether it be Protestant or Catholic or whatever, you have, an, you, you have a visible church on earth that, that's made up of, of believers, but it's also made up of unbelievers. And unbelievers who don't believe in the res... They're, they're there for their own reasons, but they don't believe in the res... They have, for one thing, they have not experienced the resurrection of power of Jesus in their lives. And they don't believe in the resurrection power of Christ. Paul said they have a form of godliness. They have an outward form of godliness. Jesus talked about them in Matthew 23. They're like graves. Graves look beautiful. Tombs look beautiful on the outside. Sepulchers, if I, if I can use a biblical word. They look beautiful on the outside, but when you go inside the tomb, it's full of extortion and dead men's bones. It's full of, it's full of corruption, especially the tomb that's been there for a while. If you were to go to the tomb of a person who's been dead 50 or 100 years, there's nothing there but bones. And, and Jesus said that's how the religious hypocrites, the scribes, the Pharisees, etc. He denounced them. He spent the whole 23rd chapter of Matthew denouncing the scribes and the Pharisees, those who had a form of godliness. They, 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 they claimed to love the law of Moses, but they had created their own man-made traditions that they felt uh, justified uh, in superseding the law of Moses. The law that God gave to Moses at Sinai. These people had risen up in, the, in what we call the intertestamental period between uh, that 400 year period between uh, Malachi, what we see as the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and in Matthew, there was about a 400 year period, the intertestamental period. And these scribes and Pharisees, et cetera, had risen up and, uh, and had created what's called the Mishnah, their own righteousness. Paul talked about it in Romans. They went about to establish their own righteousness and they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God, which is through Jesus Christ, his dear son. Now, let's go to 1 John. I'm not going to do the whole thing today because I've already used almost an hour of my time. Let's go to 1 John and just, just touch on 1 John 2, beginning at verse 15. John says, this is the same John who wrote the gospel, 
Now this is the this is the first epistle. He wrote the gospel, three epistles, and the book of the Revelation. So he wrote five books of the twenty-seven books of the New Testament. So he says uh, in First John two fifteen, he says John says, "Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him." Well, when he says don't love the world, he's not saying don't love people. He's saying don't love the sinful things of the world that will compromise your testimony and corrupt you, etc. right? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the, th these are the three things the enemy used to trip up Eve in the garden. If you go back and read in Genesis chapter 3, when, when, when uh, the serpent tripped up Eve, he tripped her up in these three areas. The lust of the flesh, Eve looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She looked at it and saw that it was good for food and it was good to make one wise. So you had the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Eve, again, go back to Genesis 3. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned willfully, but Eve was deceived. She even said herself, the devil, the serpent, I think she said, deceived me and I ate. Paul even said in, in one of his epistles, uh, he said Eve was deceived. So Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam, Adam ate willfully. Adam sinned willfully. Eve was deceived and Adam sinned willfully. Those are basically the two ways we can sin. You can be deceived or you can sin willfully. You can, you can say, I know it's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. And then, and then when you take those two categories of sin and then you put these other three like subcategories in, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, and it's not always just sex. It can include other things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, what we see, because we're constantly bombarded by what we see, especially in this digital uh, ultra high definition age that we live. The lust of the flesh. Think of David on the rooftop. That was really the equivalent of, 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 what, of, what, of what we today would call pornography. He saw Bathsheba bathing. And we just see the, the, the one case in 2 Samuel 11, right? We don't see how many times he may have seen her before that or how many times he may have seen her after that, but especially before that. We just see that one case. He saw Bathsheba. Bath, remember, kings had gone out to battle and David didn't go with them, right? And he went on his rooftop and he saw this beautiful woman bathing, and uh, uh, instead of just saying, mm, that's a nice, you know, nice looking, you know, lady, uh, you know, my compliments to her husband, nice looking. He was the king. He had power. <laughs> and he said, I want her. You know, I want her. And he inquired about her. And, they, and his people told him, his subordinates told him, that is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. That should have ended it right there. David said, mm, 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 mm. She's a bad mamma jamma, just as fine as she can be. And he and he carried it out to, to its tragic conclusion. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, pride, the pride of life, pride, pride, the pride of life. John said, these things are not of the Father. They are of the world. And the world is passing away. So anybody who's engaged in these things is having fun now. Can't say I haven't had my share, right? Anybody engaging in these things, you're having fun now, but these things are passing away. As the old people would say, only what you do for Christ will last, and that is so true. These things are passing away. And those people who would live this lifestyle, they're passing away also. And if they don't repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ, they will be lost for eternity, right? These things are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it... Watch this. And then John says, he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, now I'm going to get into the part of the conspiracy in 1 John. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue it next week. John says, little children, it is the last hour. And when, and, and when, and when, the, when the Bible speaks prophetically of the last hour, it's not talking about 60 minutes. It's talking about a time period. Because John said this 2,000 years ago, and we are still in the last hour. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist, capital A, shall co is coming. The Antichrist, you know, 666, the beast, the mark of the beast, that whole thing, has not come yet, but it's coming. But notice what John says here. This is very important. Even now, many Antichrists have come. 
Now, what does Antichrist mean? Here's where we get in, here's where we get into the conspiracy. Antichrist means against Jesus Christ or and or an alternative to Jesus Christ. Against Jesus Christ or an alternative to Jesus. That's what anti, anti means against, like an anti-aircraft missile. It's a missile that seeks to shoot down, you know, the enemy plane flying above. So against Jesus Christ or an alternative. And we see that today, just as John spoke of it, prophesied of it, preached about it and predicted about it. We see it today against Christ. The, the world is against the church. I'm talking about the true church, the, the, the invisible church. The world is against the church. Why? Because the world is in love with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. John said these things are not of the Father, but these are things that, that the enemy uses to conspire against the church and to attack the church. And if the church is not vigilant and diligent, the church will be weakened by allowing these things to infil infiltrate her, etc. So he says, it, little, he says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, many false prophets, etc. Many teachings. Because when John wrote this epistle, he was, he was writing against a teaching called Gnosticism. Gnosis, where we get the word science, knowledge. He was preaching against and teaching against Gnosticism. And there was this knowledge that people claimed to have that said that God could not be manifest in the flesh. God, because flesh was evil, that God would not become flesh. In other words, that there was a teaching that was denying the incarnation. Remember, John said in chapter one of his gospel, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory, we beheld his glory, not just at the Mount of Transfiguration, or not just when he ascended at the Mount of Olives back to the Father after his resurrection, but we beheld his glory even as he walked the earth. Even as he changed, changed water to wine and raised Lazarus from the dead and fed thousands with fish and, and, uh, and um, um, uh, um, 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 you know, with, with fish and, 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 and water, etc. Uh, it, 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 every time he did these things, John said, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, fish and bread, I should have said. Yes, We beheld the glory of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, so when we beheld the glory of Jesus, it wasn't just the glory at the Mount of Transfiguration, although that was true also. Peter mentioned that in his second epistle. He said, you know, we, we, we saw his glory at the Mount of Transfiguration, right? And we have a word of prophecy that bears witness with it, etc. cetera. But, but, but when John said in his first chapter of his gospel, we beheld his glory, he was talking about Jesus walking the earth full of grace and truth, right? No man, even Nicodemus said, no man has done, can do the things that you do and God not be with him, etc." There were even about four or five miracles that Jesus performed that are called Messiah miracles, Miracles that nobody had ever done. Even the great prophets of the Old Testament, especially Elijah and Elisha, the great miracle-working prophets of the Old Testament, there were certain miracles that even they didn't perform, especially opening the eyes of one who had been born blind. Nobody had ever opened the eyes of one who had been born blind. Jesus himself said, if I had not come and done the works that nobody has ever done, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't be as accountable for your sins. But now I've come and done those things and you still have not believed. He said that after he opened the eyes of the blind boy in John chapter nine. And, and he, he, remember when Jesus performed miracles in John's gospel, they were literal miracles, but they were meant to teach eternal spiritual truths. So when he opened the eyes of the blind boy in John nine, he was showing, he said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't walk in, in blindness. And, and then he said, I've, for this, I've, for judgment, I've come into the world that those who are blind may see and those who think they see may remain blind. And the Pharisees, you know, the, the, the same people who wanted to put Lazarus to death and eventually succeeded in putting Jesus to death based on the will of God. They said, are, are we blind also? In other words, they were pricked by their own conscience. Are we blind also? Because he knew they knew Jesus was throwing shade 
They knew Jesus was, 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 was throwing shots, if you will, at them. Are we blind also? And Jesus said, if, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about y'all. Yeah, I'm talking about y'all. Yeah, because it, because if, if, if you had said that, that I am right and you had begun to follow me, I would have forgiven you for your sins. Remember, they blasphemed. They said, this man's casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, the lord of the flies. And when they said that... They, that was the that was the red line, if you will. That was because they because then they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and Jesus said, "Oh no 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 this show no." And it was it was after that that Jesus really greatly decreased his public ministry and began to prepare his apostles uh, for his for his eventual uh, betrayal and crucifixion and resurrection. All right. So anyway, all right. So let me just touch on First John for a few more minutes, and I'm gonna close. John said, "Little children, it is the last hour." And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. That spirit is in the world today. It's the spirit that says that Jesus is not the only way of salvation. That's the spirit of Antichrist. You got high-profile politicians saying it. You got entertainers saying it. And see, people, we live in a, in, a, in a wicked generation where people would rather listen to a 21-year-old person not born again than a 61 or 71 year old person who's been walking with Jesus for 40, 50 years. That's a wicked generation. That's a wicked generation when you'd rather listen to a 21 year old entertainer and what they have to say than a 61 or 71 year old saint of God who's been walking with Jesus 40 or 50 years. And, and the 21 year old or the 25 or 30 year old can have a song uh, extolling the virtues of sin and, 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 and can say things like, you know, born this way, I was born gay, and this is the way I'm going to be, and this is the way God made me. Or, or can extol the virtue of worshiping other gods as, a, as an alternative to, to worshiping the true and living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the spirit of Antichrist. Or when a politician or a, a talk show host, a famous talk show host, can say that it's impossible for Jesus to, only be, the, to, to be the only way of salvation. And then th th this talk show host influences hundreds of millions of people as the spirit of antichrist against christ an alternative to jesus christ it's the spirit of antichrist john said even now there are many antichrists they have come by which we know it is the last hour john says it's a sign that we're in the last days and john said this two thousand years ago so when you speak prophetically an hour can be hundreds or thousands of years it's not 60 minutes not 60 minutes, excuse me. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. John said, here's a sign. They, they didn't stick with us because they couldn't, they, they couldn't live under the banner of, of, true, of the truth of the gospel. You're not going to sit under John's ministry for a long time and, 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 not, and, and, be, a, and, be, and be an apostate. You're going to eventually... You, you, you're going to eventually have to separate yourself because John, remember now, John had been a superintendent in the church at Ephesus. God had sent some of his best preachers to Ephesus. John, Paul, Apollos, uh, 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 Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, Timothy had been a bishop in the Ephesian church. God has sent some of his, uh, his a list of preachers to the Ephesian church. Remember Ephesus, they worshiped Diana, the goddess of the Ephesian, the wicked city. People were making money building shrines to Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. Remember the silversmiths got mad at Paul and his companions and beat them, etc., because they because Paul and them were preaching and messing with their money. See, that's the spirit of Antichrist. Great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians. Great is Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, when Paul came saying, no, Jesus Christ is Lord. And God has raised him from the dead, right? He shall return. Now, Jesus is still here. He's seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. I don't know where Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, is. She's gone. But that spirit of Antichrist is still with us and shall be with us until God says enough, until God destroys the world, not by water this time, but by fire, etc., and ushers in a new kingdom. That's in God's timing, not ours, right? All right, let me, let me close here. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them, 
These are apostates. See, there's a difference between apostles and apostates. Apostles are sent, like sent from Jesus. Apostates are those who don't abide in the truth of the gospel. They may have a form of godliness. And they, may get, they, and they get applause from the politicians, etc., and other religious people, and they're apostates. But apostles of Jesus are sent to bear witness to the truth of the gospel. God bless you, my beloved. I smell a conspiracy. The conspiracy is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. The conspiracy is, 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 is that spirit that wants to destroy your influence like they want to destroy Lazarus. They want to destroy you. They want to destroy your influence because Jesus has spiritually raised you from the dead. And the devil knows you're going to be an influencer, not like a Taylor Swift or Amigos or other entertainers, NBA young boy, little baby. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you won't have 200 million followers on social media, but you'll be an influence. I talked about the preacher who was preaching one day in a revival and there was a boy sitting on the audience and the name of that boy was Billy Graham. You see that? So you can be an influencer, but the but the spirit of Antichrist is going to fight against you. Antichrist meaning against Christ. The world is against Jesus. The world is against Jesus. The world, and if everybody's patting you on the back, reverend or whoever, if the whole world is patting you on the back, then that, that's a bad sign. Because the world is, is, a, is antagonistic. I'm talking about to the, the, the true church, the invisible church. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ written in heaven. The world loves the visible church to a certain extent because the visible church supports all kind of perversion and abortion and gay marriage and homosexual this and that. Yeah, the, yeah, the visible church supports that in many cases. Not in all, but in many cases. And the world applauds, applauds, the, applauds the reverend you know, who supports that. But the invisible church, the true believers in Jesus know that that's wickedness. And so then we, we end up having to fight against the, the conspirators who walk in the spirit of Antichrist. All right. God bless you, my beloved. I pray that you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has literally bodily raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation for the scriptures say whosoever hallelujah to the lamb of god whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved god bless you my beloved have a good week we'll come back next week and we'll we'll, we'll continue this lesson on i smell a conspiracy i smell a conspiracy god bless you my beloved eli yes please come help me my little engineer All right, let's see. Hold on, hold on, let's see. Is this, oh, this goes to the computer here. Sorry about that. Go ahead, do it with your finger. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm all messed up, ain't I? You gotta remember the way you have to do that. You're right, you're right, you're right. They see me, they, they see me like a lot of times. All right, hit the red button.